Good morning, everybody. Uh, thanks to Vimco for inviting me back to this uh, second uh, annual conference. Pleasure to be here. <laughs> Name is Alex Rupers from Atlantic Investment. Uh, also, uh, first of all, uh, thank you, Professor, for giving this uh, very interesting overview and tutorial. Uh, it's certainly very helpful. Maybe we should tour together. You know, it would be good to have you as a, you know, to start everybody off. Uh, with regard to the uh, Against Malaria Foundation, I was very impressed uh, with the work that's being done, and Atlantic is pleased to donate 4,000 euros uh, at this conference for that uh, cause. So happy to do that. Uh, it's a great, uh, great effort and, and very well organized. So well done. Uh, what I'd like to do, uh, they've given me a, a full hour, so I'm very uh, honored with that, uh, is to uh, walk you through a, a bunch of things. Uh, first of all, uh, you can see my title, <coughs> Excellent Points for uh, Value Stocks. I'm trying to completely bottom tick this uh, correction that's going on. You might not think it's a big correction in the uh, overall stock markets. Uh, there's been depressions, bear markets, and massive corrections in many, many individual sectors and stocks all throughout the last eight or nine years, and particularly in the last few years. Um, and if you're an individual stock picker and you're looking for value, you'll see that, the, and I'll have five stories to talk about, uh, all those companies are massively undervalued and have you know, retracted from their highs by 30, 40, 50% and trading at all-time low valuations in what is still supposedly a bull market. The bull market is, of course, uh, reflected by the index, an index like the S&P 500 or the NASDAQ, which are the big ones for the United States, are market capitalization weighted indexes. That's a mouthful. Need a glass of wine after that. But basically, uh, let's take Apple and Amazon. They're about a trillion dollar market values each. Uh, they are up quite a bit this year. They have a huge disproportionate impact. The companies we look at are between one and 20 billion dollars, average six or seven billion. If all of them would go up 100%, you wouldn't even notice it in the index. Whereas uh, Apple or Amazon going up 10, 20% has a massive impact on the index. So you really got to understand what are the largest components of the index, how are they trading in terms of valuation, and then you determine are we in a bull market or not. And frankly, you can always invest in the index, but you should really look at the underlying uh, stocks, uh, what's out there. So what I'd like to do today is a few things. Quick introduction about Atlantic. Um, Talk about the equity market dynamics. You know, this is the what's going on in the market, uh, what's driving the market, what's giving the opportunities. Then I, I talk about our investment process. This is Atlantic's approach to value investing. You know, everybody has different ways of skinning the cat, looking at different valuation metrics. We're very much in the cash flow oriented, sustainable, predictable cash flows, high barriers to entry, et cetera. So I'll walk you through all that. Uh, and then we get into compelling current investments. These are five stories. And last year I had a bunch of stories. This year I got stories. We always have stories. But these are our highest conviction ideas at this moment. We'll tell you about what these companies do, where they're trading, and what we think the catalysts are to unlock the value. So that's the idea. Um, I started Atlantic in 1988. I'm originally Dutch, grew up in the Netherlands, did my nine road a business degree, uh, got lucky to get accepted at Harvard Business School, did my MBA in 1982-84. I worked before that for a conglomerate, publicly traded uh, industrial conglomerate called Dover Corporation, where I got involved in buying and selling uh, industrial companies from the kind of private equity perspective. After Harvard, I, got, uh, I was hired by Thyssen Bornemisza Group, TBG. It's a very large privately held conglomerate from Europe that at the time actually was quite large, about three, four billion dollars in size, with 80 different companies in 40 different industries. I was in the New York office and involved in corporate development, buying and selling companies there. From that experience, I learned a few things about valuing companies, about the process of buying and selling companies. I also learned to dislike illiquidity and decided to take my tiny little tool back and experience at 20, 28 into the public market, starting Atlantic Investment with the backing of Thyssen Bornemisza, Carlo De Benedetti, and Abin Amaro. So I had some very good early backers. With that, Atlantic started. It's now 30 years later. Here we are, alive and well. Uh, gone through many different cycles, many different uh, investment uh, cycles, you have growth and value cycles, we'll talk about that in a second. Clearly we are a niche uh, global uh, public equity value investing firm. So we are looking for very specific values. We'll have a bunch of slides about our strategy, that's bullet three. Currently we have a billion in AUM. Uh, we've been bigger, we've been smaller, but you know, very strictly uh, implementing the same approach over a long period of time. We're located in New York, We've got 24 people on uh, uh, on our team, of which 12 are uh, the investment team with a long tenure with Atlantic. So that's a nutshell of what Atlantic is. Let's talk about the markets. 
Okay, this is a, an interesting uh, chart. I don't know if I can point it. Okay, these are long cycles. This is, uh, was in 1995 uh, up to today. Now, this is very broadly the S&P. This is Standard & Poor uh, Index. 500 Index is a, is a very big index that most index funds in the United States are tied to. And you have growth stocks and value stocks. Now, growth stocks clearly are the ones who are, you know, have growth, top-line growth opportunities, have higher multiples and all that. Value stocks would include uh, companies that don't have these kind of growth opportunities but uh, are solid. And so it's a very different camp. Now, there's some gray areas in the middle, but this is a, a you know, a separation of the two camps uh, in some form or fashion. And, and broadly, this is correct what has happened. Now, over here, where you see this cycle, 95 up to 2000, was clearly a growth cycle. What was happening? Y2K, internet. Biggest companies driving the markets, um, Microsoft, Cisco, EMC, Oracle, eBay, uh, America Online, companies like that. In fact, those 10 companies, I just mentioned seven or eight, 10 of them in 1998 during a crisis, there was an Asian crisis, as you may recall, there was a disastrous situation with a hedge fund called Long-Term Capital Management that was highly levered and needed to get bailed out to avoid a massive sell-off in emerging market bonds, et cetera. All that caused a systemic risk fear situation. Um, amazing stuff happened during a, a systemic risk fear situation, just like 2008, where value investing strategies and others are, are collateral damage for a while. <laughs> you know, I had my largest position in August of uh, 1998, a company called Ball Corporation, making an aluminum beverage cans for beer and Coke in the United States, no foreign exposure went from 45 to 25 in five days. Okay, <laughs> that's like a crash, okay? We came back to 45 four months later, but it was all in that environment. During that environment of 98, where we had massive drawdowns in individual stocks and in the market because of this fear and, and panic selling, um, the top 10 stocks were up 90% on average that year. People said, you know what, forget everything, I'm going for liquidity and growth stories. So the, the, the stocks I mentioned, those tech stocks, were up 90%. That Because of their market cap, they brought up the uh, NASDAQ 40% for the year. 1998 was up 40%, a year that was, to us seemed disastrous. The S&P was up 26%, the market-weighted S&P. And the unweighted S&P 500 was almost flat. The value in index, the 1,700 stocks equally weighted, was down 10%. Uh, value investors like Michael Price, Mario Gabelli, little Alex uh, at the time, were all down 10% for the year. Well, that sucked, professional word. That was bad. <laughs> you know, you go into 1999, who the hell's raising money in 99? Well, not us. We're like just defending and holding off, you know. And in 99, everybody who raised money were the guys and the women who were invested in those 10 stocks and had 40, 50% up years in 98. Of course, you know, money chases performance. It's the weirdest thing in my book because I buy stuff that's down. So if you buy a car, a house, or a dishwasher, you buy it when it's on sale, not when it's just skyrocketed, right? If you buy contemporary art, you buy it when it skyrockets. When you buy a stock, you buy it when it skyrockets, unless you're a value investor. So that's what happened in 99. Very natural behavior. The tech bubble is purely a result of all that. So in 1999, the average tech fund was up 145%. And I had many investors that I had, the ones I had left at the time, saying, you know, why don't you just buy some tech? I, said, I can't do it. I'm going to get a rash. You know, I, need, uh, I, I can't do this stuff. I don't invest in stuff that's flying up with high valuations. Well, and in this market, you have a company like Cisco, which uh, makes the plumbing for the Internet, and yeah, the Internet was it, right? So $20 billion stock growing at 20 30% a year, that's where you had to be. Well, Cisco ended up trading at five, uh, 25 times revenues, $550 billion market cap. The most expensive stock in the world in the end of 1999 was Cisco, okay, maybe into early 2000. You want to punch up the Cisco start today? It's at half the value 18 years later. Not that that means that this will happen to every stock that's up there, but just saying. It was ridiculously overvalued, and people were just throwing money after what worked. Please don't fall into that trap, okay? Always question, what is the value of the thing? Calculate the enterprise value which is very simple, you can do it at home. Price of the shares times shares outstanding, you all know that, and then plus the net debt or the cash. And so that was the tech bubble, right? Up 145%, early 2000s. Uh, funniest thing ever, uh, Steve Case from America Online, with all the funny money of the market value of America Online, goes out and buys a real company with stock called Time Warner. 
with Bugs Bunny and CNN and all the stuff that's inside of Time Warner. A real company. Took 100 years to build. Lousy $80 billion market value. They had $200 billion. Boom. On stage at the press conference, Steve Case, who normally walks around in a T-shirt because California style, you know, was dressed up in a suit. And Jerry Levin, the head of uh, Time Warner, figuring, oh, I'm now joining the new cool crowd. I was in a T-shirt. It was the funniest thing ever. Anyway, that was a disastrous uh, M&A you know, deal. In my January report of 2000, I wrote, if there's ever a bell at the top of this nonsense, it is that deal. Okay? I was about six weeks early. And so six weeks later, I think in Holland, Worldline went public, which uh, was a, another AOL knockoff for Europe, uh, was really the bell at the top. 9th or 10th of March is when everything went the other way. And I was actually in meetings in Geneva where 98 or 99, I would uh, invite 40, 50 people, maybe 10 would say yes, and then three would show up, and they would feel bad about themselves being there and about me. You know, it was all embarrassing. And literally in 2003, I, I needed to rent a ballroom at the Hotel du Rhone, and there was no, it was only standing room only. And I, was, I only could joke about it because I said, listen, the way I find shorts in the United States is I go to the Plaza Hotel, at the time it was still very much a hotel, I go to the DLJ Emerging Growth Conference, and I literally walk through the hallways and see where the people are piling out of rooms, write down the name of the companies presenting, and pretty much do a tiny bit of analysis and short it, you know? <laughs> and that's uh, the way you do So I'm a little worried about all of you being here. So here, in cycles, this was clearly, I think everybody agrees, this was a growth cycle that ended in a bloodbath for those who were in it, and there were all this, a whole new, all these portfolio managers, all the venture capitalists, all gone. You don't even hear about them. Few have survived. People forget, you know, and then a new generation comes in. So we had then a tremendous tide with us in value investing for, from the early 2000s until the crash roughly, or a little bit before the crash of 2007. And it was incredible. Then the crash happens. Okay, we don't have to go through all the details of that, but post-crash, it's been basically said, okay, people said they're very scared about a bunch of things. They want to be in larger caps. They'd rather be in an index, and they'd rather be in growth stories. So we've had a... 11-year growth cycle. Now, during those years, we have made money here and there, but it's not been easy being an undervalued mid-size to smaller cap stocks. So that's where we are. We are now at this level, and I'm putting this title out here with a question mark, and at the end of my presentation, you'll see that there's an exclamation mark because I do believe it's an excellent time. Now, I might miss it by a day or two or a month or two, but we are very close to having a rotation to value and, uh, you know, one of the things that has happened here is, of course, passive investing. People have basically agreed, as they did in the mid-90s, that individual stock picking and value investing really doesn't pay that well. You're better off giving your money to a mutual fund at Fidelity and just go into that, and they'll just replicate the index that they're trying to cover. Those are the mutual funds. They're still around. They're very big. And then you have the ETFs, exchange-traded funds. Now you can just... Trade like a stock, the spiders, the diamonds, the IWMs, Russell 2000, you can buy all these things. And uh, BlackRock and, uh, for instance, Vanguard Index Fund are massive aggregators for those kind of monies. Uh, they're each $7 trillion each. They own 10% of every company in the United States. And they're pretty much running out of things to do with their money because they're getting $40 billion a month going in there. And what does it do? As Amazon becomes, instead of 2% of the index, 5% of the index, they buy the new money, 5% Amazon. So the money just keeps on flowing into the large guys all the time. Of course, there's some going into the smaller ones too, but it's so uh, small relative to the total pie. And frankly, in many cases, they already own 10% of these companies and they're not allowed to own much more. So we are at this stage uh, where passive investing has taken over, where a decline in momentum investing can cause an avalanche of selling in these kind of names uh, and I think we're kind of in a market that's trying to figure this out right now with all the kind of macro factors that are an issue. The issues in the market are clearly, in the United States, rising interest rates. Uh, rates were at ZERP, zero interest rate policy. They're still at ZERP in Japan and ZERP in, uh, in, in Europe because uh, Draghi's afraid to raise rates because that would kill his country, Italy, and so it's already bad as it is. So we are at ZERP, and ZERP makes no sense. ZERP is morally wrong. It's a tool that can be used in a crash or to avoid a crash, maybe, but it is wrong. Think about it. At the end of the day, the grown-ups, hopefully the central bank chiefs, should be encouraging saving and discouraging massive speculation. So let's go to 2% rates, short-term rates. So a yield curve maybe should be 2 to 4%, long-term 4. That, is, and that would be, if I can script it, that would be a perfect yield curve. Nothing crazy. You know, the the S&P 500 dividend yield is 2%. 
So if you go over 2% on the short side, you're starting to put a real break on housing, on car sales, on adjusted, you know, on, on interest-sensitive uh, loans. And also you're starting to have people switch from the stock market into cash more than they should, perhaps. In the United States, for instance, we have $11 trillion of interest-saving accounts that were earning zero for about six, seven years, right? If you are a retiree in Florida with, say, 10 million bucks, and, you know, fantastic, you've achieved it in your life. You're sitting there in early 1990, you're 60 years old, and you're getting 6% on the bank, thanks to Greenspan. 6%, that's 600,000 bucks a year. You can buy a bunch of, you know, uh, kids' toys, uh, Christmas vacations, you can do your golf club, you can pay for your mortgage. I mean, things like that, you can do it. Now it's zero. So you're forced into the stock market. And once you're forced in the stock market, you don't want a stock pick, you just buy the, the large cap. So that's what's been happening. Then there's about four, $5 trillion worth of interest-sensitive loans out there. You know, mortgages, adjustable rate mortgages, uh, credit card loans, et cetera. So those things, if you add the two together, there's about a $7 trillion gap. If you raise short-term rates by 2% from zero, arguably there's about $140 billion of additional GDP spending power, particularly by the savers that's coming. A little bit of pain on those who have adjustable rate mortgages, but a lot of benefit for the savers. That's all very positive. So I've always been saying it is economically accretive. It is good for GDP, good for the economy, if you raise short-term rates from the bottom back to two. On top of that, you have a tool to fight the next crisis. You can lower rates then again if you have to. So they did that in the United States, but they've gone further. <laughs> That's why Trump is blowing his fuse on uh, his appointed uh, Federal Reserve Chief, Mr. Powell, who's gone a little loopy, and he's, he's going past the 2%, not that uh, everybody talks about the 2% the way I do, but he's just going on, and he's saying, you yeah, know, I see a lot of growth, I see a lot of inflation, so we're gonna keep raising rates. Well, that is gonna, that's what's causing the market a lot of problems. On top of the fact, of course, we know about uh, the trade uh, issues, and that is causing inflationary forces, you know, and first in steel, aluminum, and other things, and now there's all kinds of other worries you know, about a slowdown of China, which is part of the trade policy. Mr. Trump is to bring China down a notch or two, so we make sure that the United States is number one, even when China has this 2025 plan to be number one. So there's that little game going on. So there's, the market is, is being weighed down by the interest rate situation. Corporate earnings are good because of the tax rates and the economy, but people are worried about it. So those are the kind of things that are going through in the market. Amidst all that noise, we have value and growth cycles to deal with. And we're about at the end, in my view, of a uh, growth cycle. And the reasons uh, for a rotation to value is multifold. One, the valuation discrepancy between the value and the growth blocks are at historic uh, highs, or the gap is enormous. You know, you can basically, this is a market that is happy to pay 12 to 14 times revenues <laughs> for profitless companies with a 20 to 30% top line growth opportunity. I mean, you only have to look as far as Tesla, you know, to see clearly it's a growth company, clearly it's doing a good job in a lot of areas, never mind uh, its CEO sometimes. Uh, but, you know, it's valued at $50 billion today. It was up a lot yesterday. We might have a good print today for earnings finally. Who knows? First time. But it's $60 billion value. Compare that to Volkswagen, for instance, $240 billion in sales euros, 40 billion in EBITDA with gross cash flow, trading at about a hundred billion dollar value, two and a half times EBITDA. So one and a half times the value or two times the value of Tesla. Volkswagen owns a few brands, as you may know, Volkswagen itself, Skoda, not that important. I think Bentley, all not that important. What's important is Porsche, uh, Audi, <laughs> you know, things like that. Uh, there's a company that's called Ferrari. It's a luxury, it's like an Hermes on wheels. You know, it's a luxury brand trading at about a $20 billion market cap last time I checked. If you take Porsche public, maybe not Ferrari, but could be worth $80 billion and make a lot more cars than Ferrari, as you can imagine. So just taking Porsche out of Volkswagen, you're done with the entire, you get Audi for free, you get all these things for free. And you get a dividend yield. So this is the kind of market we're in, right? So you have all kinds of um, rewards for high growth stories up to the crazy levels, whereas normal companies that are not growing at that kind of level are trading at five to eight times after tax earnings. So that's where we are. So you got that as a, you know, that the rubber band, you can only pull that far. I mean, gravity does not go out of favor. Some people say, when will it ever turn? So well, it could be an article, it could be a collapse of, a, of an Amazon or a Facebook, anything like that, any 
collapse of, you know, you don't wish bad on any of these names because uh, a lot of you are invested, a lot of my clients are invested. I wish everybody well investing in these names, but just be aware what you're owning when you're in these names. They are full of risk. Now, there are some cracks going on in the, um, in the FANG index. FANG is Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, and Google. You can throw Apple in there, you can throw Microsoft in there, but these are the big guys. Uh, Facebook is having some issues. There is, you know, in, in the late 70s, we had AT&T. It got busted up because of uh, regulation. It was too, too powerful. Amazon, under regulatory review, okay? Amazon trading at 60 times earnings, trillion dollar company. What can possibly go wrong? Nothing, except that the growth rate slows down. Law of the big numbers. You can't grow at 60% of your trillion dollar company. Well, I might have said that when they were at 500 billion and I was wrong. So maybe I'm wrong again. Fine, if you're wrong and you own the stock, if they grow only 20%, the stock will come down by 50%. So that's the risk that you're having with your largest market cap or one of your largest market caps. So it's regulatory risk. It is law of the big numbers risk. Uh, it is, you know, a whole bunch of issues are with the, you know, here the concept stocks like Tesla versus uh, the, the old names. Another thing about rising rates, okay, growth companies are quite, valued, quite often valued on a, you know, future uh, value of the cash flows and then a terminal value. And that is then discounted back and depending on the volatility and the growth rate, there's a higher discount or a lower discount rate. But all those discount rates have to move up as the short-term rates move up. That's just the way they're, they're tied together because you have a risk premium on top of the fixed rate and the fixed rate is going up. So that we know. So as the, the rates go up, the terminal values become less and therefore it puts a kind of a damper on uh, growth stock uh, terminal values and discounted cash flow values. If you think about uh, General Motors, if you think about some of the companies I invest in, some of them are old economy companies with many former employees and current employees that are part of a pension plan. The pension plans have suffered massively as rates went to ZERP. You know, so we're all so busy trying to save the economy and going to zero interest rates. Well, what happens to your pension benefit obligation, which is you have the pension plan as assets and it has liabilities. The liabilities is the payouts that they have to make depending on how many people are in the plan, how old are they, and how long will they live, the actuarial assumptions, and then they put a discount rate on that. Well, the discount rate has been going down. As it goes down, the PBO, pension benefit obligation, balloons, and the pension plans are massively underfunded suddenly. So where did the cash flow of the old economy value stocks disappear to in the last 10 years to fund this artificial or real gap in the pension plans? Massive amounts of money has to be uh, given to the legacy liabilities of a company as opposed to new plants, new products, and everything. So it was a huge burden. Rates are going up. As rates go up, PBO comes down. F plants are pretty fully funded and now become overfunded. Ha! Relief for a lot of these companies. Now they can start spending money on debt repayment, new products, acquisitions, and share repurchase. So that's you know, a generic comment, but rates going up gives pricing power to industrial companies that they didn't have before, and it gives an, a relief on the balance sheet and the cash flow directed to legacy liabilities, and it is actually a little bit of a dampener for growth companies. So far, that has not shown up too much, I can tell you, but it is in the works, in my view. So those are some things to think about uh, in terms of the equity market dynamic. Um, overall, we have a very good economic picture, by the way. I mean, people are climbing a wall of worry. It's unbelievable to me. We have the lowest unemployment in the United States. It's very low unemployment relative to where it was in, um, uh, in Europe. And um, you know, overall, the economy is doing very well. Most of our companies are doing very well. They are concerned about the trade situation. They are concerned about rising interest rates, yes. But I mean, overall, there's a good level of activity in the economy out there. So. People should be a little bit more uh, breathe and relax and just uh, remove all the noise. Because again, the, the, the noise is amazing, right? If you think about the news media that we all look into, it's a lot more interesting to film a house on fire or to see a car crash and all the cars are driving around just fine. So the news bias is so directed to the one murder, the one house on fire, the one car crash, whereas a million people are walking around just fine, a million houses are not on fire, and millions of cars are not crashing. Okay, and yet we're looking at just that crappy stuff that's terrible. And the same happens with uh, stock market news and financial news. Take a deep breath, step back, go for a walk, come back, and just invest normally. Just keep your, your, ground, your feet on the ground. And then the volatility can become your friend, you know, to invest. All right, let me 